Is fluoride really poison? And is it the reason behind our society's IQ decline? As a longevity doctor, I hear questions like this a lot. So today we're going to get down to the truth. Fluoride is the most controversial mineral in America. It's in 73% of our water supply. The CDC calls it one of the top 10 public health victories of the last century. But a recent federal report linked it to lower IQ in children. Can both things be true? And is that paradox enough to make people lose their minds? I'm Dr. Hilary Lin, Stanford trained physician and longevity specialist. Today, we're not just team fluoride versus team anti-fluoride. We're team science. By the end of this episode, you'll know how much fluoride you're probably getting if it's too much and what to do about it. So where did this all begin? Colorado Springs, 1901, a young dentist named Frederick McKay, fresh out of school, ready to make his mark, opens his first practice. Day one, first patient sits down, opens their mouth, and he just stops. The teeth were covered in brown. It looked like they were dipped in chocolate, mottled like marble. Second patient noticed the same thing, third patient, and by the end of the week, he's seen dozens of the same picture. The locals shrug it off, they're used to it. It's called the Colorado brown stain. Like it's totally normal to have teeth that are brown. So this is where it gets interesting. Most dentists would have just accepted it as a weird regional thing. But McKay, he becomes seriously obsessed. He spends the next 30 years, three zero years of his life chasing this mystery. What happens next is McKay teams up with Dr. Black, the godfather of modern dentistry, and together they examine nearly 3,000 children with these hideous brown teeth. And they discover something that makes no sense at all. These kids arguably have the ugliest teeth in America, but they have way fewer cavities than kids anywhere else. And this is an era before fluoride toothpaste, before modern dentistry, when most people lost a bunch of their teeth by 35. So these brown stained teeth are basically indestructible. It's like finding out your neighbor's seriously ugly car is bulletproof. So McKay goes full detective, travels to Oakley, Idaho, where the brown stains mysteriously appeared right after they installed new water pipes. Coincidence? And then he goes to Arkansas, a company town owned by Alcoa Aluminum. Kids down there also have brown teeth. Kids in a town five miles away, white teeth. Something's in the water, literally. The standard tests at the time couldn't find anything. For 20 years, there was absolutely nothing. But then a major breakthrough. Alcoa's chief chemist, a guy named H.V. Churchill, is freaking out. He thinks people are going to blame his company's aluminum cookware for the staining. PR nightmare. So in 1931, this Churchill does something nobody else has tried. He tests the water using this fancy edge technique, photospectrographic analysis. And the result is fluoride. He finds 13.7 parts per million. To put that in perspective, imagine taking a glass of today's fluoridated water. Now multiply the concentration of fluoride by 20. Turns out that's what kids were drinking every single day. Mystery solved after 30 years, McKay finally has his answer. So fluoride isn't just some weird chemical we invented. It's definitely not a government conspiracy, no matter what social media says. It's literally the 13th most abundant element in Earth's crust. It's everywhere. It's in your groundwater, your soil, your food, your water. But this is where the science gets genuinely fascinating. So your teeth are also made up of minerals. They're made up of something we call hydroxyapatite. And when fluoride shows up, it doesn't just coat your teeth like a paint. It literally infiltrates the crystalline structure, converts it to something called fluorapatite. So think about it like this. Your teeth are wearing this chainmail. Fluoride comes along and upgrades it to titanium armor at the molecular level, filling in all those gaps. And this is important because your mouth is a serious war zone. Every sip of coffee, every bite of bread, every single thing you eat or drink, your bacteria in your mouth throw an acid party. And your teeth are the dance floor just getting destroyed. Without protection, your teeth would literally dissolve like chalk in vinegar. And for most of human history, that's exactly what happened. If you look at some skeletons from long ago, you can see massive tooth loss by the age of 35, not from poor hygiene, not that they weren't trying at least, 
but because the teeth were literally dissolving because they didn't have enough fluoride. This still happens in many parts of the world that don't have fluoride or proper dental care. We see kids with these mouths full of black stumps. We also have adults crying from the pain of abscessed teeth, infections that spread to the brain and kill. So when your conspiracy theorist neighbor starts ranting about fluoride being forced medication or unnatural, tell them nature was already fluoridating water. Just pretty unreliably. Some places had none, and then you'd have rampant tooth decay. Other places had way too much. We see some places in India and China that have 20 or 30 parts per million, and their bones are turning to rock. So what we did in the US at least, is we took this chaos and added a bit more precision in the form of water treatment. This is no different than adding iodine to salt to prevent goiters or vitamin D to milk to prevent rickets. We saw what nature was randomly doing, finding out why it worked and optimize the dose. But here's a million dollar question. Did we get the dose right? Because here's the thing, the same mechanism that makes fluoride so effective, its ability to incorporate itself into our bodies at the molecular level, that's what also makes it potentially dangerous. When we added fluoride to our waters in the 1940s, it was a miracle. We cut the rate of cavities by 50 to 60%. But the problem is now we have way more sources of fluoride. Fluoride toothpaste, fluoride mouth rinses, fluoride varnishes at the dentist, processed foods made with fluoridated water, and pesticides even, leaving fluoride residues on your vegetables. We solved yesterday's problem, rampant tooth decay, so effectively that we may have created tomorrow's new problem. So the question isn't whether fluoride works. It definitely does in preventing cavities. The problem is, are we now getting too much of a new thing? So in August 2024, there was a report that really broke the internet. The National Toxicology Program, which is a team of scientists which usually keeps their head down and is really boring, they released a report they'd been wrestling for years. And I mean three drafts rejected by the National Academies of Science before they finally pushed this one out the door. Their conclusion was when fluoride in drinking water creeps above 1.5 milligrams per liter, children's IQ scores tend to slip. Non-giant leaps, we're seeing 1.6 points for every extra milligram. And on an individual level, that might sound like nothing. But if you zoom out and apply that shift across an entire generation of children, that's an entire society nudged to the left on the intelligence curve. So most U.S. water supplies are set at 0.7 milligrams per liter, which should cause no problem at all. But nearly 2 million Americans drink water that's just naturally higher than 1.5, not because anyone added it, but because of where they live a zip code lottery, essentially. And it isn't just our brains that fluoride is affecting. Fluoride has another target, your thyroid. Your thyroid is like the engine control for your body, metabolism, energy, growth. And it runs on iodine the way cars run on gas. Fluoride, unfortunately, is close enough in structure to trick the system. It slides into the iodine's parking spot and blocks it. So in 2018, a Canadian study found adults who were low on iodine but high in fluoride exposure had thyroids essentially sputtering kind of like a broken engine. They had higher TSH, a signal that the thyroid was struggling to keep up. Now, mix that with our modern bougie diets. If you're using pink Himalayan salt, it looks beautiful in the jar, but it doesn't have the iodine added to it. A lot of processed foods have a lot of salt, but no iodine. There's also so much less seafood in the American diet than is healthy. We've essentially set the stage for iodine deficiency to creep back as a public health problem. And all that extra fluoride walks right in to make it worse. This is not just theoretical. In Detroit in the early 2010s, doctors met a 47-year-old woman with bone pain so severe she couldn't climb stairs. Her teeth were gone. X-rays showed bones as dense as steel. And the cause was her daily habit of iced tea. She was brewing pitchers from 100 to 150 tea bags every single day. And it turns out tea leaves are naturally loaded with fluoride. She had something called skeletal fluorosis, which is a condition doctors in the US almost never see until her. There's another case where a 53 year old woman walked into a clinic after breaking her foot. It was a pretty routine scan, but it turned out on her bone density scan, her T score was plus 11 in the spine. For context, plus two is considered super excellent. You've got the hardest bones ever. But hers were so off the charts, so hardened that they actually fractured on their own instead of flexing. Harder doesn't always mean better. 
These are real published medical cases, and this shows what happens when fluoride tips from being friend to foe. After hearing all of this, you're probably thinking, what am I supposed to do with this information? And you probably also have a bunch of these commonly asked questions. So let's go through them one at a time with real evidence. First up, should we keep using fluoride in our water at all? This is tricky. I lean towards yes, because if we use it wisely, then we are still cutting the 50% of cavities, which would otherwise be rampant everywhere. It turns out that when cities remove it, we have evidence showing that that tooth decay returns. Calgary, which is in Canada, stopped fluoridation in 2011. And within a few years, children there had significantly more cavities than kids in nearby Edmonton, which had kept it, especially in lower income families. So this is a really big public health issue. Remember, fluoride drives remineralization. It pulls calcium and phosphate back into early enamel defects and forms that fluoroapatite, which is more acid resistant. That's why early lesions can stop or even reverse if you have the right level of exposure to fluoride. Next, is Europe banning fluoride? No. So many countries deliver fluoride just differently than us. They use fluoride in their salt instead or have school rinse programs instead of putting it in the water. So it's the same goal reducing decay, just a different route. We might actually want to consider some of these because the rinse program might actually do a better job of making sure all kids get the right level of exposure. So if you're thinking about having kids or you're pregnant or you already have kids, what should you do? Know your number. If your drinking water is around that 0.7 milligrams per liter, that's great. But if it's over 1.5 milligrams per liter, you might want to switch your main drinking and cooking source, especially during pregnancy and infancy for your kids. And you might want to try treating your water. Brita filters aren't going to do the trick. You're going to need reverse osmosis, distilled or verified low fluoride water. You might want to keep topical fluoride around, so keep it in your toothpaste, just make sure your kids aren't swallowing it, or ask your dentist to apply the fluoride varnish. That's a local benefit with minimal systemic exposure. Now let's talk about bottled water. Fluoride content varies widely, and water labels often don't disclose it. If you're mixing infant formula or you're pregnant and you're deciding, do I use bottled water? Do I use my tap water? You probably want to stick to distilled or reverse osmosis bottled water, unless you're sure that your tap water doesn't have way too high levels of fluoride. Also, you still need fluoride for your babies. It, it still does help them. So I don't want to say you want to get rid of all of your fluoride for your kids. And I've been asked, do kids really end up in hospitals for their cavities? It doesn't really sound like a big deal. And yes, they absolutely do. Tooth decay is a horrible, horrible problem. We've just kind of forgotten about it in countries where fluoride is prevalent. In the UK, for example, decay is the leading reason young children go under general anesthesia. It's not as common to have fluoridated water, but the regions in the UK that have it see way fewer extractions and fewer hospital admissions. Other than parents and kids, of course, who else should be cautious about your total intake? There's two major standouts, folks with kidney disease. Fluoride is cleared in your urine. If you have impaired kidneys, you might hold on to it longer. So routine exposures are going to accumulate. Also, like I mentioned before, if you're a heavy tea drinker, watch out. Tea leaves naturally concentrate fluoride. So if you have extreme long-term habits, like brewing really strong teas daily for years, that can cause that skeletal fluorosis we talked about. It's really, really rare, but it's a reminder that your sources can stack. So the theme here isn't that fluoride is bad for you or that it's a miracle mineral. It's really about the dose and the delivery. You wanna keep it surface level on the teeth and measure it and manage what you are swallowing, if any at all. For your kids, you're gonna to wanna to keep the amount of fluoride toothpaste, because I still recommend you use fluoride toothpaste, to a minimal amount. For infants, because they're really bad at spitting, you're gonna use just a bare smear of toothpaste. And for kids who are a little bit better at spitting, you can use a pea size amount or less. This balance isn't as dramatic as it sounds. It's totally doable. And for most of us, fluoride probably isn't a problem at all. If you don't have kids or any serious medical issues, the reality is your body is dealing with the fluoride, whatever the level is in your water, perfectly fine. But if you do have kids or medical conditions that you're worried about this fluoride level, what should you do? Check your water, know the number, not just the assumption. You can buy online testing kits for around $40 USD. 
And you can use fluoride smartly, like I mentioned. Control the amount of toothpaste you're using, especially for your kids, because they tend to swallow things that they shouldn't. And protect the vulnerable. If you're pregnant, you've got kids who are really young, folks in your family who have kidney disease, you're going to want to manage the systemic intake even more. Your teeth aren't just for photos. They anchor nutrition, confidence, and long-term health. Cavities can ripple into infections, miss school, and even heart disease down the line. So use fluoride for what it is. It is a tool. You use it on the enamel, don't eat it as much as possible, and you can protect both smiles and your brains.